Um, can you tell me about the day that it happened? So from the very first thing you remember, like what was the weather like, what the site? It was a, well, it was the 6th of April, 1966, and it was a Wednesday. And I was in science class. Uh, the weather was quite clear, it was a blue sky. It was coming up to Easter, our Easter break from the end of the week. And I was in science class and a student rang it, ran in, it was about 20 past 10 in the morning, just before morning recess flung the door open and said, Mr Greenwood, Mr Greenwood, there's flying saucers in the sky, there's UFOs or things in the sky. And of course, we all just burst out laughing. You know, yes, right. Anyway, it was nearly the end of the period, so he said, well, and the, then the, the person that was a girl ran off. Anyway, he said, OK, well, come on, we'll pack up and we'll all go down and have a look. So we all packed up down the corridor, out the bottom of the steps, round towards the oval, and there are all the kids running around and, and you know, having going crazy and whatever. I don't recall any of the sound at the time uh, because once I got out onto the oval and saw what I saw, I was absolutely transfixed. I, my whole vision was on trying to, to just look at what I was seeing in the sky and take in every single detail I could. I don't remember any of the noise. There was a lot of noise, apparently, because the kids were excited, some were frightened, uh, whatever. But I can just remember standing there because I'd never seen anything like that before and I wanted to take in as much as I could because, wow, this was just amazing, just amazing. Mm. Uh, can you describe the object in detail? So well, I saw more than... I saw actually saw three. Now, there's a bit of... Um, oh, not so much controversy or whatever, but some people... We just wonder because of the m movements uh, that perhaps there was only one in, or two in the sky at the time and because they, they moved so fast it looked like there was, was more but there, there were numerous circles on the ground later. So, you know, but they were like flying saucers and that's what we used to call them in those days. You know, in, in comic books and all that sort of stuff, that's what they were. They were flying saucers, so we called them flying saucers. And that's exactly what they were. And they were amazing. Um, can you tell me about what happened like immediately afterwards in relation to Well, they were in the sky for a, quite a long time and they were up and down and hovering all over, you know, especially over the power lines. And because there was um, big power pylons in, in the bottom of the schoolyard and they were over there. And then there was about, oh, I think there was, how many, there was, planes, small planes like Cessnas that came probably from Moorabbin because we were very close to Moorabbin Airport. Now they came in and they were buzzing them. Now we were watching all this and it was like they were playing cat and mouse. These things could move like nothing I've never seen. They, the plane would come close, the saucer would go up, it would go to the right, the other one would go this, that. They were all over the place and the planes had to turn all the way around and come all the way back. These things were just having a game with them. It was just amazing. Now they were in the sky for, oh, would have been probably 15, 20 minutes. Then they went up in the sky and disappeared down behind the Grange, which is the area. The Grange was a huge um, area of a mixture of market gardens, paddocks, um, pine grove, um, you know, bush, all sorts of stuff. Now we used to do our cross country runs there. So we would come out across the road and just go and we disappear a place there was a great place there was an old house in there that was like what we called the haunted house and you know all this sort of stuff and and they went in behind behind the trees there and a, and a few of the kids had actually ran down and jumped over and took off into the grange to try and see where they'd gone so they were gone for a while and then we were still all standing there and then probably I don't know five or so minutes later the craft came back into view up into the sky and there was the, said the three of them and they what the middle one I can always remember it was quite big uh, it appeared big and I think I've had a discussion with one of my friends who was there at the time that it appeared big because we sort of think it was closer to us the other two were sort of further back so it, it appeared to be bigger than the other two because it was closer to us and it took up took off straight in the sky, turned on the side like that and the sun hit the bottom of there and you got the beam of light and then it just went and the other two just went the same, gone and they were gone. 
So that was fine. Anyway, kids were running. So then we all sort of gravitated back towards the school um, school uh, quadrangle and that. And then I can remember after not long after that, we were all sort of, we noticed um, cars and everything in, in the street because opposite us was the Hume Pipe Factory in those days. And I was hanging over the fence on the gate, which is still there next to the caretaker's house, watching, and there was these jeeps that turned up. Now, they looked like army jeeps, and they had the covers over the back and whatever, and then the men got out of the jeeps. Uh, they lifted the, the uh, back up, and the men got out of the jeeps, and they were all in green, and some of them were in camouflage uniforms. And that, so I thought, definitely, they're army. Got to be army. So they were there for a while and they were talking to each other. There was two or three of those. They were talking to each other and then they all jumped back in and they took off and they went down to what was obviously down towards the Grange somewhere. Now, after that, um, the bell went and everybody sort of tried to, they tried to get the kids back into school, but it was a bit of a mishmash about things. But other people had arrived and there were people in blue uniforms who looked like Air Force. Uh, there were also men who arrived in, in uh, black suits. Um, later on, the police were there and also an ambulance had been called because one of the girls apparently had had, um, had some sort of an episode out and they had to take her away. And um, then we had later that, that day, or mid more, yeah, what was it? And it was coming up to said lunchtime then and then we had an assembly and, and the... The um, principal, Mr Zambleby, who absolutely ruled with an iron fist, um, told us that we were not to talk to anybody, not to speak to anybody in the media. What we'd seen was a weather balloon and that we're all massive hysterically, you know, massively hysterical, forget about it, didn't happen. But as he was telling us that in the assembly, behind him we, you could see these other people in the background, they weren't up close, but you could see the people in the suits and whatever else in the uniforms. So that was it. And then later that day, um, Channel 9 arrived and the reporter, I got interviewed with I think about three or four other kids and we were standing out of the front of the school and I always have very strong memory of a man in a blue uniform and I assumed he was, I think, pretty sure he was a policeman and he walked up to me and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said to me, now you stop talking and all you go back inside the school. And he turned his back on me and pointed at the cameraman and he said, you stop filming and you go away. Now that was on the news that night, that film, that was on, but that has since gone missing. Um, so I got detention for that. Um, so did everybody else. So yeah, it was a very exciting day. And my elder sister was there uh, but she hadn't seen the craft, but she said to me later that day, she said, we're going down to have a look because we'd all been told, don't go near the Grange, stay away from there, you're not to go down there. So, of course, being kids, what are you going to do? We want to go and have a look, something's going on. So, anyway, she took me down and we, we just walked across the road near the primary school, little um, gate into the, into the paddock, and, yes, there was a, a circle that the grass was about yay high and it was totally flattened in a round circle and we were crouching down looking because there were men in there which looked like the army and they, they were doing stuff. I don't know what they were doing. They were digging up and doing all sorts of stuff. Anyway, she got frightened and said, no, no, come on, we've got to go. We're going to get into trouble. So, of course, we get home and she's rushing in. She tells mum, Joy's going to be on the news tonight. She's going to be on the TV. And I was. So <laughs> there you go. And then the following day after that, uh, back to school and whatever. Was it the day after? Yes, it was. I was at home and we'd come back from school. Uh, there was sort of, it was like uh, the couple of days after that, everybody had been, you know, sort of calmed down. You know, don't talk about it. It was really, but uh, people, I guess, these days don't understand that that's how that could happen because it wouldn't have happened now with modern technology and all that sort of stuff people with phones and and things that would have been on youtube in two seconds flat but um we were told and because of the era and whatever we were told don't do it you didn't do it because you got in trouble you know different mindset
yeah, different lines in it. So anyway, yeah, we sort of went and then it became, I got visited, we got visited home by the Victorian UFO Society, I think they were. And it was an American man, Paul Norman, and a very glamorous lady and another man. Now they came to our house in Springvale and they interviewed me and my sister. And it was funny, we didn't even have the telephone on, so I don't know where they got our address or whatever from, but they rocked up. And we sat at the kitchen table with mum and dad and my younger brother and I drew pictures of what I'd seen and my sister told them what she'd seen. And they went and they came back another day and took me down to where, because by this stage after, the, by the week, whoever, the people, the army or whatever had come back and everything had been slashed and burned in the Grange. They burnt where the circles were. They'd slashed and burned them. And, um, but they took me down and took a photo of me standing in one of the, the burned out circles. But my memory of that's very vague. Mm. Well, to kind of continue on from what you were saying then, um, like what effect did it have on you at the time and the immediate months that followed, like especially the... At, at the time, to me, I was very excited. I was excited. It was a real adventure. Some of the kids were really frightened. Um, but to me, it was just exci it was exciting because it... And, something that I'd never seen before ever and, like, and I've never seen since and um, yeah it didn't, it didn't sort of affect it but I see my father at this stage I was working at government aircraft factories now he was building Jindabix and Mirages that's what he did and he used to spend a lot of time down at Avalon and um, he came home must have been about six weeks after the event and he said to us there's to be no more talk of the UFO Okay, and I said, yeah, okay. No explanation as to why. I don't know whether he was trying to protect me as a father or whether he'd been told to put, you know, put a lid on it because of what had happened. So, and look, we, after we, we all then went on our um, Easter holidays and whatever and sort of talked about it for a little while after, but sort of there, and there was an article done with one of the kids in the, the um, Danny Hong Journal so, yeah, nothing sort of much happened. We just sort of all moved on. Mm. So did you feel supported as a child by kind of adult figures or was it not that, No, not because we've been, well, I suppose we so much feel threatened, but in a way we were threatened. We were bullied, to you know, because we were told, don't talk, if you do, you're going to get into trouble. And, but I was lucky because my parents believed me. Some of the other kids' parents didn't. And told them that you know don't talk rubbish you don't you, you're all you know you don't know what you're talking about I don't want to talk about it but I was lucky because my parents were very supportive at the time what did you think it was well that's to me it was like I said it was nothing that I'd ever seen before haven't seen since I honestly think it was something from somewhere else unless somebody can stand up and say it wasn't. That's my personal opinion. I honestly believe they were from somewhere else and that's why I think it would be the intense to cover it up was, was so intense is because I think they were frightened of mass hysteria if it, if it got out, that people were, because of being with Vietnam and the Cold War and all sorts of stuff going on in the, in the 60s, so yeah. And then, like, moving on a little bit, because uh, throughout your life, how often have you told the story? Um, well, it sort of got put behind for a while. We had a school reunion. It must have been about, oh, gosh, it was about 20-something years after the event. And, you know, that was the first thing everybody, remember when, remember when? And it was really quite amazing. Um, my husband, of course, I told him when I first hooked up with him, and because... Uh, um, he believed me because my girlfriend was there too, um, fam family because mum and dad, but over the years it didn't, didn't say much about it because of people would say, you know, if you did, oh, what drugs were you on and how drunk were you and all this sort of stuff. I was 12 and a half, goodness me, you know. And you fear of ridicule and just because your life's going and you don't want people to think you're a bit crazy and, you know, just, yeah. Yeah, funny things. I'm going to cough. Yeah, well, going to that point there, um, have you faced any backlash from sceptics for telling a story? Oh, God, yes. One? Oh, God, yes. Over the years, I've had people, lots of people just look at me with like, oh, really? 
you know, and, and like you said, just make comments about you being crazy and you don't know what you're talking about and it couldn't have happened and it's all in your head and all, you know, it's just stuff. And that's why a lot of people haven't spoken about it because a lot of the kids went on to be, you know, as we all did in pursued careers, policemen, lawyers, psychiatrists, doctors, nurses, factory workers, truck drivers, you know, all of us moved into different areas. So some people, of course, haven't spoken about it because it would have affected their careers. So, you know, regardless of whether they, you know, they, they know what they saw, we all know what we saw. You know, and to be debunked continually with the theory of being a weather balloon just annoys me no end. Because there is no way in hell a weather balloon could have moved the way they did. So, yeah, there were many other witnesses, of course. Um, do you know if it's affected any of them negatively or how it's affected people? Um, I don't think so much negati negatively. Mostly, I, to me, personally, I saw it as a positive thing. I felt, actually, I feel now quite privileged to think that I had the opportunity to see what I saw. Because a lot of people nowadays are more, in, I guess, into it because of technology or whatever, are interested in, in things that are different. Um, yeah, I think some people it probably did affect as, as far as because they couldn't talk about it because of ridicule, because of, you know, the, the careers or whatever they were in, that it might have affected them, their, their, you know, long-term things. Perhaps, too, the way you deal with people who are negative towards you. I've always been sort of of the attitude that I don't have to justify myself to anybody because I know what I saw and nothing's ever going to change that. And that's in my head. That's in my brain. And it's an experience like nothing else that I've ever had before, except for the birth of my son, which is just in my, it's in my brain. It's a memory that's never, ever going to leave regardless. I put it aside, you know, over years occasionally and then it come back up. But... No one will ever take that away from me and I don't have to justify myself to anybody. Do you think there are people out there right now who have the answers? Do you think the answers are there? Uh, yes, I do. Um, but whether we ever get them remains to be seen, I think, because of all the, all the you know, hoo-ha that everything just seems to have been covered up so much and whatever else. But... Basically, and most of us you, you talk to people about it that were there, witnesses, others. All we want is an answer. All we want is for someone to say to us that, yes, we know what that did happen that day. It was a very extraordinary experience, but something definitely did happen that day. It wasn't in your imagination. You weren't on drugs. You weren't drunk. It happened. And I might go a little bit, a tiny bit off script, but I was wondering because... Um, throughout a lot of the interviews, a lot of the witnesses, mm. um, a lot of teachers have refused to go on record, especially adults at the time. Yeah. Um, why do you think that's the case? I think they were told. I think they were warned. I know that Mr Greenwood had been visited apparently, and that's true, that night by, um, who was it, someone, I think it was the Air Force, and they told him that if he spoke about it, he would be charged under the Secrets Act and they would discredit his name and... You know, he would, his career would be non-existent. And he was a new teacher. He was only very young. He was probably, oh, I don't know, probably about 22. He used to drive an MG, a red sports MG. <laughs> and he was a great teacher. So have you felt you've had any closure on the incident or was it just always...? Um, yes and no. In, I think because it's more to the fore now and there's a lot more people who are interested and quite open-minded about it, um, yes. But then in other, other ones, I think some people just will always never believe because there was uh, one teacher who we um, had spoken to and she d told had said that it didn't happen. And you know why she said it didn't happen? Because she didn't see it. And I said to her, and this was probably only within the last couple of years, I say, you're calling me a liar. You're telling me I'm lying. As a child, you might have been able to, but not now. So according to her, because she didn't see it, it didn't happen. 
how can you say that to 200 odd witnesses? You can't say that. Do you honestly think you will get an answer one day? We live in hope. We live in hope. We're hoping. I think it gets closer and closer all the time, but yeah, we live in hope. And you did kind of answer this before, but because um, not only is it a once in a lifetime experience, it's essentially once in a, like a never time experience. Mm. No one ever sees something like this. Are you happy and pleased you saw that, or would you rather not have? Or? No, I'm glad. That's what I said. I see it as a privilege. I see it as an experience in my life that, for whatever reason, was meant to happen. You know, I, I feel quite um, yeah privileged. I've, it's given me the opportunity actually to meet some really lovely people, to renew friendships with people from school and all sorts of stuff. So it's, it's been an adventure, but it's been enjoyable. <laughs>